All right. Hello and welcome to the Hollow Herald podcast episode number 13, I believe this is. Wow, we're racking them up really quick. Uh, this week, uh, I'm, it's just going to be a little more intimate podcast. Uh, luckily, I'm not by myself, but I'm joined by my good friend, Alex. Go ahead and introduce yourself, buddy. Well, just like Eric said, it's me, Alex, once again. It's a little bit lonely today, just me and Eric here at the Hollow Herald headquarters. But like I said, we, we got some really exciting stuff, so uh, let's jump into it. Yeah, so uh, this week, I guess we have a couple announcements that I forgot to mention last time before we started, but I think we edited it into the uh, pre-recorded version, but I didn't get to announce them in the live version. So starting now, uh, starting as of po- two podcasts ago, we're actually doing timestamps for um, time mapping our podcast. So each discussion, every time we change a topic, there'll be a quick timestamp for it. So you guys can quickly just jump to the topics you guys want to hear about and drop your input in and everything like that. And we're also doing a link dump. We've talked about it for a really long time, but we're finally doing linked up. So either in the live chat, if you guys are live or in the uh, description below, you'll find all the links to everything we talk about. We're, we're pretty good at getting mostly everything, but uh, yes. Also, if I could ask you guys a favor, if you guys are um, listening to the pre-recorded version of the podcast, if you guys could timestamp your comments. So if you guys have input, if you guys think we said something really correct, or if you guys think we said something really correct, um, most likely the latter, um, go ahead and drop a timestamp so that we can easily reply and see what you guys are talking about. Because sometimes we'll just get random comments that are like, yeah, Alex, you're so right at that point, And it makes it kind of hard for us to uh, reply because we have no idea what you're saying Alex is right about. So, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, if you guys could just drop a timestamp too, that'd be great. Um, and for any other commenters that want to jump into the discussion. So it looks like we actually have a few people here today. We already have Joseph and Joe in the podcast. Welcome to the live stream, guys. Uh, we have seven other people that are watching and they're just kind of idly sitting there. Go ahead and drop us comments in the live chat. We love the back and forth today. Uh, well, every day. We love the back and forth. But yeah, so I guess let's go ahead and we're, we're just going to jump right into it this week. Last week we had a lot of, t- we talked about a lot of things. We talked about uh, Microsoft I.O., some of the Magic Leap drama. Yeah, so this week we're just going to jump in, right? Some of our topics we're going to cover this week is we're going to talk a little bit about um, some blockchain stuff. We're not going to get too heavy into it. We're going to wait till Paul gets here because Paul is obsessed with the blockchain. So <laughs> we're, we go, we're, we're going to wait for his expertise and knowledge. Uh, but we'll just dabble in some of the news that's been happening recently. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Google I.O. because that just happened. That was a big deal. Uh, some really cool things were announced there, even in the AR realm. There was quite a bit announced there. Uh, what else was there? What else are we going to talk about? Um, oh, in the future of retail, Amazon's been doing a lot of crazy stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. And we're just going to jump right into it with our first topic. Go ahead and take it away, bud. All right. Well, like Eric said, just some of the stuff that, that, that I've been looking at has to do a lot with um, transportation and just how it's slowly be becoming automated and how more and more companies like Google and Tesla and GM ha- have really kind of brought on this, I don't know, not, not quite industry, but kind of angle the transportation, having it be like completely automated. And uh, I found an article where it talks about um, NVIDIA releasing their, their own car, but it's not, um, the way it's programmed is it's um, it uses... Uh, like deep learning, so it learns from humans, and I thought that that was very interesting because like they, they don't just program it, it; it learns. Like this is artificial intelligence learning from a human with driving. That was a little bit unsettling to me because humans aren't, you know, notorious for <laughs> being good at driving. So why having, why, why have like a faulty subject teach this AI? So, question, did you say this was NVIDIA that's making this? Yeah. Wow, we've seen NVIDIA dropping into a lot of different realms lately. You know, normally they would stick with uh, graphics processors and certain programs and stuff like that. But, I mean, they're, they're really 
like broadening. I mean, that kind of shows how big of a company they're becoming. Like that's that's the signal of a of a big company is when they start broadening it out. Like Google started with their search algorithm, and now they're into every department possible. Same with Microsoft and all that. So I wonder if Nvidia could be another tech giant in our field in the next little while. I mean, they've been killing it with their graphics cards, and they're like the leader in that industry. So why not breach into some other some other stuff? Um, is is it's interesting that they're getting into self driving cars. Everybody's been kind of getting into that lately, haven't they? Yeah, it, it, I don't know. It, it almost bothers me mostly because I, I still, I kind of have trust issues with AI. And it's not because I've seen iRobot a thousand, a thousand times. It's simply because um, AI is still able to fail. And I feel like, you know, that there could be some, like, like there could be failures at catastrophic levels if we put too much trust in AI. So it's because. So sorry to interrupt. So it's interesting that you're saying this because I remember on like pop podcast, uh, podcast like one or two. I don't even know if it's one we released. You know, it's one of the test ones we did. Uh, uh, Austin was the exact same way. We we had this basically this exact same discussion where uh, how how do you feel about uh, artificial intelligence like taking over your healthcare or uh, or taking over your car when you're driving it and he was very hesitant and he said he was say, making the, a lot of the exact same points you are because it can fail and stuff like that but um the idea of an uh, of ai and algorithms because most of the time how ai runs is it's an algorithm that basically runs you know you've been using uh quote unquote artificial intelligence you know, since you used a calculator, you know, two plus two equals four. That's an algorithm that runs. It's slight artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, it's never failed. Two plus two always equals four on your calculator, right? I mean, you never put that into your calculator and it's come out wrong, right? That's true. That's, that's a very good point. So so I guess the, the struggle comes is to build these algorithms and build this artificial intelligence in such a way that it doesn't fail. Like mathematically, it's almost impossible to fail. And about 99% of the time, you'll notice, uh, like let's say you're putting in a math, math equation to your calculator. You're putting in 2 plus 2, and it doesn't come out as 4. You're like, whoa, that's weird. And then you go look at it, and you put 1 plus 2. You hit it wrong. It's going to be user error for a lot of the times, you know, whether that's programmer's user error or whether that's uh, um, or whether that's like a user's error, the person that's using the program or the uh, the the hardware, whatever it happens to be. So, mm-hmm. so I guess that's the kind of the route you have to take a look at it. Is like, what would you rather have is a, a computer doing your math for you or a person doing their math in their head for you, kind of thing. That's true. That's a good point because you think like take for example like a heart surgeon, like we've talked about <clears throat> a lot of breakthroughs and we, we've seen uh, a great deal of breakthroughs dealing with like automated surgeries and automated assistance, and you know like the more you think about it, just like surgeon surgeons and surgeries fail. So I feel like you know if if AI can like get its act together, it would fail less. I mean, granted, it would it would fail. Maybe because like there's never going to be, there's always going to be some extenuating circumstance where something goes like probably for the human wrong. though. Yeah, that's probably due to human error, not the, the not the uh, the the program fault. You know, it would probably be due to uh, hu- like the human, like something's wrong with the human, like he has cardiac arrest or something, and the program can't fix that. You know? Yeah. But yeah, the thing about it is, so like a surgeon, you know, when you're going in and you're getting a life life threatening surgeon, you know, I, as a lot of people, that's like one of the things they would never trust a robot is a surgery. And I think that's what actually one of the first things, like if they could prove and there was taste, test studies, case studies done and it was proven good, uh, I would go in and I would definitely get a surgery way before I would pick a surgeon because a surgeon, a lot of things play into how you perform at your, like at your job. So, I mean, surgery and surgeons is a job just like any other, you know, you have good days, you have bad days. Let's say you have a hangover or that got, the surgeon's wife just got a divorce with him. There was a big fight and she took all of his kids and then he has to come do surgery on you the day after. You're not going to want that guy coming to do surgery on you, right? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. What with an AI, like you're not going to have to worry about, you know, like divorce court, like this AI isn't going to have a hundred things on his mind because an AI is programmed to solely perform surgeries. So, I mean, I guess that is a good point because like the human brain is a very delicate thing and even surgeons can, 
can, you know, so succumb let's, to the, certain issues. The surgeon's a, a racist or a, a misogynist or something, <laughs> you know, you're not going to program a robotic racist. Well, I, at least I hope not. You're not going to, a surgeon, you know, the surgery is not going to have any bias to you and it's not going to get under pressure. Like if, if it's your best friend performing a surgery on you, there's going to be a certain level of pressure there. The robot's not going to give a crap. It's going to do the same amount of, same level of surgery on you that it is on this. And what's really cool is, you know, we have our local town surgeons and we have decent surgeons and we have, uh, you know, we have great surgeons. We have like l world leading surgeons. So what you, what's going to ha what's going to end up happening is they're going to get the world leading surgeons, the best of the best people to meet with some of the world's best of the best programmers, like the lead people at Google, the lead people at whatever, whatever the lead like medical engineers are, you know, and they're going to get them together and they're going to build a master surgeon, get like hundreds of the best surgeons in the world and hundreds of the best programmers, and they're going to build something. So you're going to, instead of just having one random surgeon doing this job on you, you're going to have literally hundreds of people that have put work and forth effort to do this on you. What do you think? How do you think about that? That's That, that would be incredible, but you, you have to take into account, I mean, these surgeons, like, they're, they're probably brilliant, right? They can probably see that further down the line, their job is now obsolete. It's going to be AI. It's all going to be automated. And then the world is suddenly no longer going to need surgeons. Because like you said, like these surgeons, like they're probably really, really coveted, world-renowned, like rich people go to them. Like Bill Gates only goes to this one surgeon. But at one point, for example, somebody who lives in like the slums of Mumbai in India, needs a brain surgery. You know, he could go to an automated surger, surgeon, I mean, and get the same type, type of care that Bill Gates' granddaughter would get. You know, so, I mean, that, that, that would have some damage economically, I feel like, and I think that the world of surgeons, I mean, I'm stepping into territory I'm kind of unfamiliar with, but I can imagine people would, would be bothered with the fact that it would be harder for them to get money eventually. Exactly. I mean, there would be hopefully the best of the best in the world don't really care about money. They're hopefully basically set and they're, well, a doctor's ult is to make the world better. So any doctor that would say, you know, they take the doctor's oath and they're going to heal people, you know, and obviously they need to make money, make profit, but hopefully they would put more, put forth for a better cause, you know, like that. Yeah, I realize that's, assu that's assuming a lot from people, but I, I, w I would hope that that's what would happen. What's interesting though is I think a lot of fear, you know, fear, fear comes from the unknown. That's just a fact. Like, the less you know about certain things, the more you fear it because you don't understand it. And, I mean, that comes from space. That comes from crocodiles. Since I'm not a crocodile trainer, I'm not, you know, crocodile trainers aren't scared of crocodiles. But I don't know a darn thing about a crocodile, so there's no way in heck I'm going inside of a crocodile pen, right? You know, but let's say if I was a trained and I had some knowledge or I was with someone that had a lot of knowledge, I would not be as scared. And I think it's the same with artificial intelligence, just on a much broader scale. I feel like people are very intimidated and very scared by this overwhelming sense of, and this big keyword, artificial intelligence. Like people don't even understand what that is. They think that's robots taking it over, but they don't realize that uh, using Excel is using a form of artificial intelligence or using a word processor is a form of artificial intelligence and using word checker and using these things that they've been using it for ages. You know, the birth of the computer, a calculator, you know, these very simple things that people would say are simple are forms of artificial intelligence. So uh, I think people get really scared because they don't understand this big buzzword and they don't understand the technology behind it. And they think, oh, a computer can fail. My computer at home is a piece of crap because I don't know how to run it, you know. So therefore, my self-driving car is going to be a piece of crap. You know, they have bad interactions. So I think that plays into a lot of this, this fear mongering behind artificial intelligence. And I wish there was like a more healthy way to explain this to a broader mass. Do you think there's any way that we could, like basically just the discussion I had with you, but we could have with a mass of people, you know, we're having it with our podcast, which is pretty awesome. But, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, but like everyday people that aren't going to be listening to a tech podcast, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there really isn't kind of a way that you can just say, Here's this technology. Let's gradually ease you into it because, you know, like you said, Microsoft Words, uh, artificial reality or artificial intelligence. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. a brain fart there. But you know, like I'm sure, back when it first came out, people were super just like, okay, what is this? How does it work? You know, they're they're kind of leery, just like, what is it? Like, why would I just type it out when I can write it down on a piece of paper? But years later, look at it, Microsoft Word, like. 
everybody and their dog knows what that is. It's, it's, it's just something that you use. It's a tool now. And, uh, so I feel like, like maybe eventually, you know, it's going to, you know, self-driving cars are going to come out and people are like, why can I just, why would I want a self-driving car when I can drive myself? Mm -hmm. But, you know, years down the road, everybody's going to have a self-driving car, you know? So I feel like, you know, it's like you said, like people fear the unknown, but the more uh, time goes on, you know, the more the unknown is exposed and people see what it really is. People see how it works. Mm -hmm. Like, like, granted, there's going to be updates. People are going to fix things. And, you know, I I guess, you know, the the more we talk about this, the more self-driving cars seems like a plausible idea in the future. (laughs) <laughs> Joseph's in the comments and uh, I'll, I'll touch to what you're talking about but he, he mentioned what if your uh, artificial intelligence surgeon uh, gets hacked and I think that's an interesting um, idea because it's kind of scary you know there's security breaches all the time there's hacks all the time you get malware and just, just recently there was a very big uh, surgeon streak like think if your automatic surgeon machine is not updated correctly and like all the hospitals in europe they get shut down you know i mean that's a very realistic possibility but you know with convenience and with uh improvements on technology a lot of the times we have to sacrifice security we were just talking about this weren't we uh so alex this 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 broadens us into our next subject a little bit um go ahead and uh also joseph said that and asked alex do you want to be the guinea pig for ai surgery (laughs) <laughs> did you see what i replied no i didn't i didn't oh i just put the have to pay pay more than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i i don't know would you do that that's a, that's an interesting question we'll, we'll go ahead and ask our viewers so let's say uh so there's a proven um not not proven you know it, it, it it's been good enough it's passed enough tests that they're ready to the testing phase and test it on real people uh what what's like your price to go under the needle from an uh automated robot surgeon Mm. I, I pose know. this to you in the in the commenters too, whether you're in the pre-recorded version or the live chat. I'm I'm curious what's like your guys's price range. You know, I'm gonna say a solid like fifty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I I was thinking like at least four figures, but if I really do have like a brain issue, and I can get like experimental, uh, like a exper- experimental surgery for free. I, I probably wouldn't complain too much. Yeah, it, it was so okay. Let's say it's not like a super like dangerous surgery, you know, but uh, it's just easier to do with a robot. Like I don't know, it's it's a surgery you would normally get. So what's a surgery normal people like like hip replacement surgery? Let's say you're gonna get hip replacement surgery, and you can either have the chance to go to a uh, a normal surgeon or a robotic surgeon, and they're going to pay you to do the surgery on you. Uh, what what's your price range for the robotic surgeon? For something like a hip yeah, for something like a hip replacement, probably like yeah, fifty hundred bucks, and I'd <laughs> fifty you know, hundred bucks walk away <laughs> smiling. <laughs> I guess you came out of it pretty good. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. I, I think my price is pretty low. I have a lot of faith in you know programmers and robot builders and stuff. You know, maybe a little bit unwarranted faith. Yeah, but if they're willing to pay you, you kind of have to extract a little bit more out. <laughs> you know, like you got to leeway. I, I'm, I'm curious though. This would be interesting to to pose a question to people our age, and then to like our grandparents and our parents, and see what they would say, and see how how much. Like my grandpa, I could guarantee you, you would be paying him large amounts of some large amounts of money to get a hip replacement surgery from a robot you know what i mean so it's, it's it'd be interesting you know how do you think your parents or uh, family would respond um I, I don't think they'd they'd support it yeah i don't think so either so i don't know it's, yeah, it's just like maybe it's just like the older generation and them being like leery to technology in the first place and then having ai surgeries like something big like that come in i don't think that I, I get, it's a pain in the butt just trying to get my dad to play Xbox. I can imagine how it'd be to get him to do surgery. <laughs> You're so right. That's 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 a good point. Uh, so I guess sorry, I got distracted a little bit. But 
the idea of security with these technologies, I mean, there's going to have to be extreme security, but I mean, that's with every technology, you know, there's a give and a take and ebb and a flow with security, uh, you know, um, programmers versus hackers and security versus people that want to break that security. It's an ebb and flow. And this, this has to be, especially something like self-driving cars and uh, a medical robot has to be something that, uh, is on like the forefront of security, you know, but uh, it's interesting because, you know, with this convenience, like we, we always talk about this, you know, with convenience and with, uh, with uh, forwarding technology, a lot of the times we have to give up a uh, certain, right. I don't want to say rights, but we have to give up certain personal information. We have to give up uh, a little bit of our freedom a little bit. So, so go ahead and tell me that statistic you told me about before the podcast started. Oh yeah. So I was talking to my dad a little bit. Because with some of his business ventures, he's uh, gone a lot into analytics and how people buy things for some stuff that he's trying to open up in other cities. And one thing he talked about is he, uh, in a conversation he was in, he heard that like the younger generation, I guess, like the millennials per se, um, ha- have been found to not like go to Walmart or Kmart or Costco, just like retail stores like that. And like get all their groceries and like make make a trip once or twice a month. Um, that that's not something they'd be as apt to do. Um, it'd actually be quicker for them to just stop at a gas station and pay more for like a gallon of milk or pay more for something else, you know. And they're they're willing to do that simply because it's quicker, and they're willing to to make more trips and pay more simply because it's quicker. And, and that surprised me, you know, because like granted, like you'd you'd have to take a day, like have to take a Saturday, and go to Walmart, and pay for and, and buy, you know, your two weeks worth or a month's worth of groceries. But uh, I guess for them, that 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 seems like outrageous. So for millennials to simply be able to get off work, stop at Chevron, buy their milk, and head home, like that's no more than five ten minutes out of their day, even though they're making more trips, even though they're paying more that are willing to do that. So I, I think this is really interesting, actually. And I didn't think about it like this, you know, uh, with a stores are now starting to carry to it with the Amazon go stores that we've been seeing popping up everywhere. And the, uh, uh, you know, the, the delivery, you know, and, uh, Grubhub and all these different things that like will deliver it straight to your door. We're seeing like this mass convenience wave come through. This massive, I'm okay to pay a little bit extra if I don't have to deal with it. You know what I mean? And I think we're seeing that. Um, what? Why? What are some of the reasons you think that it's our generation that's so privy to this, Alex? I feel like our generation, like we kind of grew up with technology being a convenience. You know, just like everybody, just like the more convenient, the better. And I feel like, I mean, that's what I've seen growing up. Yeah. I feel kind of bad right now. I can't think of like anything specific right off the top of my head. Oh, for example, like writing a letter. Like I could just email you rather than write you a letter. It's, it's faster, it's quicker, it's more convenient and cheaper. You're and right. I feel like our generation just has had this cram down our throats. And now stores have to cater to this. For example, like Walmart is now doing, like you said, just like you, you call and you basically order your groceries. And when you show up, they have it all ready. They have it all in a cart. And you just place it in your trunk, swipe your card, and leave. So, and keep going. So I think I have a couple plausible reasons. You guys in the comments or the, uh, the uh, don't be too harsh on millennials. We're not that bad of people. But uh, <laughs> uh, in the live chat or in the... Uh, in the comments below, leave you guys this kind of reasons why you guys think that this is something that's more privy to our generation. And I think you're exactly right. Um, I think the technology is f- finally there where we can achieve such convenience effectively and cost effectively, you know, with an app and stuff like that. Because think about back in the day, if you want to have automated groceries, you would have to mail your, your order list to somebody or call them and give them your grocery list. And then they would have to have people on call center duty to go and pick that up and stuff like that. So software's made that a lot easier, you know. So it's this level of uh, technology has definitely improved it. One of the th- one one thing I think is interesting that I didn't think about is I think our 
generation and our time, not just our generation, people that live in today's world, we have a lot of distractions and we have a lot of things to keep our attention. Instead of, you know, back in the day when you're done with work and you can go home and catch TV or whatever it happened to be was your media of choice, you know, there's so much media to consume and there's so much entertainment to consume. There's so much information to be at your fingertips that it makes it very hard to weigh these things. You're saying, I could either go and do some shopping um, right now or I could stay home and watch some Netflix or uh, watch some YouTube or make a podcast or listen to a podcast or do whatever these things are and you're going to weigh those. You're going to say, or I could do both by paying a little bit extra. I could sit here and I could consume this information or I could go. But back in the day, you didn't have the option to pay a little bit more and do that and you didn't have all that media right at your fingertips. So I said, so instead of being specifically to our generation, I think it's this world that's kind of been built up around us, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it's a very good point. And I like what you said at the very beginning, you know, just to summarize it, just like as technology advances, more opportunities present themselves. And yeah, like you said, back in the old days, it was harder for there to be something like self-checkout or harder for something to be like just this, um, just like people getting your groceries for you and bringing it out of your car. And I feel like like multitasking has kind of become a big part of like our generation, you know. It's like what you said. I can play Xbox and listen to a podcast and have my groceries delivered to my front door. That is that's insane. Like when when what other point in time could you could you do that? It, exactly. And this is this is a topic we talk we probably about every other every third podcast we definitely hit on. <laughs> is is uh is it's just a different medium. You know, we're still getting groceries. We're still consuming medium. I mean, we're still cons- consu- consuming media. It's just through a different medium. You know, instead of going and picking up our groceries and spending time and doing that, you know, uh, we have them delivered to us. You know, we're still getting the groceries. We're still paying for that service. And, you know, you're still doing it. It's just through a different medium. And people just don't like how mediums change and how mediums can do so. But I get an interesting comparison to draw for this is not everyone in our generation is like this. Like um, me and my girlfriend are very good examples of this. She's, she's great. She, she goes and once a week she goes and she does her shopping and she plans all of her meals for the week. And she goes and she, she buys everything she needs at the grocery store, all the fresh fruits and vegetables and whatever. And it's all really healthy and really great. And, uh, she goes to the store, she buys it, she comes at home, she prepares it all, she cooks it all, and she eats it throughout the week. Whereas I, on the other hand, if it's not microwaved, it probably doesn't go in my body. You know <laughs> what I mean? If it's not yeah. reheated or from Taco Bell, it's not something that goes in my body. So, and these, we have different priorities, you know, I, um, whereas she really enjoys that time to cook and she it, enjoys, you know, planning meal prep and uh, she enjoys the healthiness factor of it and everything like that. Whereas I I would too, but it doesn't really equate to me worth it, right? How how do you think that? And I think that's something uh, that's specific with our age right now and not necessarily our generation, right? Would you say so? Yeah, I feel like simply because this aspect is new, it's weird for everybody else. But if you want to wait like 20 years, this would be perfectly normal. We'll be the adults now, and it'll be our kids that will be doing the same thing. And they've grown up with it their whole lives, so for them it's normal too. Exactly. Or or the fact that it's like it, like this, this, this pseudo period between like 18 and 30 is – if you look back at most people's times in life, most people didn't eat healthy between in their early 20s. You know what I mean? Most people no. did not prepare a lot of their own meals in their early 20s and stuff like that. Most people probably picked up stuff from the convenience stores and stuff like that because they were just dumb and young. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but if we look at those people now, they've grown up and they've matured and they, they've realized that you know there's benefits to be had from – uh, XX, whatever it happens to be, you know what I mean? So I think it's just an interesting paradigm to draw. Instead of saying specifically our generation, it's, I think it's easier to say our age demographic at where we're at right now, you know? Yeah, I feel like that's a fair statement to make. But uh, I'm excited for those Amazon Go stores. Would you use one? Um, Yeah. Actually, reading reading through what this, what this is, I remember just like a little backstory. I remember me and Austin were buying some things for for the office, just some snacks and drinks to put in the fridge to have on hand. And Austin's like, just imagine the day that you can just walk out and it'll and it'll automatically charge your account. 
then like less than two weeks later, here I am on the internet, and I find this like Amazon Go article that explains literally what came out of Austin's mouth like a week ago. And like me and him, like we simply didn't know it existed. So either we live under a rock, or I don't know. It's just hard for us to to hear about things. But it, it really a little bit of both. A little yeah. bit of both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, 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 as hurtful as that is, it's probably true. But there's a little paragraph here. It says, Amazon's Go stores are designed for customers to walk in, take what they want, and leave. All without having to go through a checkout line. Customers scan their Amazon account when they enter, and the store tracks what items they pick up, charging them when they leave. The stores reportedly will only require 6 to 10 employees per location. <laughs> So, I mean, that's exactly what Austin says. Like, we just go, grab our food, grab our drinks, and then leave. Just like that. And, and I feel like, I mean, it's a really great idea just because, like, having to wait out, uh, wait in line at the checkout stand. Like, when you're that guy who has, like, three things in his cart, and the lady in front of you has, like, just bought for the month, you know, another on that topic. And she's got, like, two shopping carts and, and the bagger is like super socially and just wants to see how they are. And it's taking their sweet time scanning, like the hundreds of things that she has in her cart. Like that can be very stressful. And that would take, it would take that stress out of your day-to-day life. You know, exactly lines just like that. And it's the evolution. It's the evolution of things. You know, there was Mm -hmm. uh, there back in the day, you know, it was, uh, you had to like, if we go back way far back, like pioneer days. Okay. Uh, if you wanted something that wasn't very, very basic at your general store, you had to make an order request for it, you know, and they had to get it and they did shit and he had to order it and he had to do all this stuff. And then you had to get it in and then you had to go to the store and pick it up once they got it in and then you could have it, you know, if the general store didn't have it, you know, you, you're either out of luck or hopefully you could order it in, you know, and then evolution came in where we had really great transportation and we had stores and for quite a while it's been this traditional checkout method where uh you know or it used to be back in the day they didn't even have the uh the scanners you know you so then so then after that you know you would have a a wide array of choices but uh it took forever because each product had its own price so the price tag had to be written down or tallied up using a a a traditional uh cashier's thing whatever they're called uh Cash registers, thank you. A traditional cash register. And then cash registers got smart and we invented barcodes. And so then barcodes came through and you could beep, 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 quick, add it up really quick, and then you'd have to write a check or cash, you know. And then after that came the credit card and, you know, swipe, 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 boom, boom, boom. And then came self-checkout. And self-checkout is terrible, by the way. I mean, have you ever not struggled at a self-checkout place? Not a whole lot. There's always been an issue I remember the first time I used it, I scanned something twice. And I remember, oh, crap, I scanned something twice. So instead of simply being able to, like, delete what I'd scanned twice, the whole thing, like, exploded. The lady, like, the automated voice was just like, please hold while a Walmart assistant comes to your aid. And this lady had to go out of her way to come over, like, turn a key, scan a badge, then delete the item. And then told me to keep going. It, it was kind of traumatizing because everybody was looking at me. Like, this machine didn't subtly say there will be somebody coming. It it let the whole world know. So I was just kind of hiding in my jacket, trying not to make eye contact. And every chance I get, I'll just have somebody else scan it for me and figure it save me the trouble and the, the social scrutiny. So I, I, I... It's it's always that issue. There's always something wrong with them, and it kind of sucks. It's a, it's a, I think it's a great technology idea, but the software and the hardware behind it is absolutely terrible. Mostly the ones I've tried is like Walmart, Sam's Club, and those kind of self checkouts. And I mean, oh my lord, talk about unhelpful uh, UI and like it just is slow and it is buggy and it's just terrible. I mean, I mean, I know it cuts down significantly on their time and their workload, but I mean, they could they could have put a little bit more effort into their software. I mean, I don't know, it's pretty sad. But I use it every time. So, I mean, it works. <laughs> it's good enough for me to to not transition over. So, I guess now the, that you've now that you've mastered the art of self-checkout. 
it, it's not master, dude. I mean, I, I think I'm pretty good at it. But every time me and my girlfriend go and buy stuff, it's like she has to like walk away and just like let me sit there and do it because we end up getting frustrated. Like, because someone will grab the groceries off too quick, and then if you're doing it with two people, it's just like the end of the world. So regardless, there's still issues. There's still issues. I mean, freaking yeah, self checkout. <laughs> Great, but terrible, you know, <laughs> bane of my existence. So, so, but I mean, I guess the evolution after that is to remove the self checkout portion of that and make it even a smooth, streamlined process where you just shoot right through in and out. And I think that brings us on to our, I mean, we're talking about stores a lot. I think that brings us on to, uh, so that, that makes the end process easier. But did you see when we were watching Google IO, I don't know if you guys checked out Google IO that was just happening re- recently this last week. Um, but they released some pretty cool AR stuff, augmented reality stuff. And uh, one of their main things was uh, being able to guide you through stores using augmented reality and point you exactly to where you want to be. Yeah. yeah, I do remember that. And I believe that example the guy used was Lowe's, which, which is a very, very good point. Because like, there's a lot of, like, especially like what with this like do-it-yourself kind of revolution, I feel like Lowe's or Home Depot and other stores like that are kind of the, the go-to locations for, for people who are super big into do it yourself. The problem that I've noticed is that it is so hard to find stuff at places like that. Not that it's unorganized, it's just that there's so much different stuff over such a large distance, it's kind of difficult to just get in and get out. And the demo that they used, it had the person like select the kind of product they needed. For example, just like a type of screw. There's like 87 different types of screw, and each screw has like different variants, different sizes, different, like it's insane. And they're able to type in just like the specifics, and the phone, like the technology, was like all synced up to the the store's database, and there was a line, like this yellow line drawn like on the phone. The person, all they had to do was hold up their phone, and through the camera, they could see a yellow line guiding them to the exact location of their product. And the guy said it was accurate by up to like 10 centimeters. Yeah, it was insane. What was cool too is it uses the, so, so we've had that idea forever. I think we actually talk about that in the podcast, how you could even like turn it into a mini game or we wanted to make an app like that where through your HoloLens, it just guides you to right where you need to be. I mean, in hyper reality, they did it. It's sort of like the first initial things you think of with augmented or mixed reality is like guiding you around right to where you need to be, you know, or plans the fastest route for you to get all your groceries. You just feed it your list and it tells you the fastest route to do it. In, out, boom, bam, no checking out, gone, you know, slick as can be. Um, And no need for uh, a lot of of the employees, which is kind of a bummer, but uh, it's just evolution, just how it's going to have to go. Um, (laughs) But... (laughs) But what was crazy about the Google I.O. thing was the way they were doing it. There was no sensors built into – because you use your phone. So there's no sensors built into your phone to be able to see your surroundings and map it. And then they have that map of it. It used um, a mixture of your camera and a mixture of GPS to positionally – it would add points in your space using the camera. It would find defined points and add all these little maps. I mean these little dots everywhere. And uh, just like – infrared without infrared which is really cool uh just think of the way the connect works but through your camera mapping like specific points but but no actual lasers or anything i mean it's really incredible uh, we'll, we will post a link to it i'm not gonna go find that exact point in the google io but in the description below go ahead we're gonna post a link to how they did it it's really incredible technology um and they, like you said, it could get it down like really close, like millimeters or centimeters, so close to it. And using this dots and GPS, it could map you through it. And I mean, it's really interesting. We'll have to next week. We don't have a whole lot of the podcast left, so next week we'll probably touch on this. Uh, a big, a big note from Google I/O. You know what? Let's just get into it. We're gonna get to do it. Let's just talk about Google I/O. So that was kind of the introductory to Google I/O. What were some of the announcements they made, Alex? I think the one that blew my mind was just how different Google Photo has become. Just like all the different things, like how you're now able to just like seamlessly share with specific things with specific people and just how smart your phone is getting. I think one of the biggest things was like the recognition software that they've plugged into Google. For example, with the Google Lens? Yeah, with the Google Lens. Exactly, yeah. Um, for example, like this guy got a notification, your buddy Roger, 
seems to be having a good time at this party. Would you like, uh, in this picture, would you like to send it to him? It's like something like that. It will notify you, hey, it's like, this is a picture of your child. Would you like to send this to your wife or your significant other? You know, just like stuff like that. Just like how smart the software is getting it was mind boggling. So yeah, Google Photos, I mean, they really beefed it up. They spent a good chunk of the two and a half hours talking just about Google Photos and the cool things. I mean, and I mean, they just beefed it up like none other uh, to the point where exactly like he said, when you take a picture of a group of people, it'll auto find out who all those people are, which is not new technology. But what's really cool is it'll automatically add it to their Google Photos. And it, you can decide if you want to share a Google Photos library with them and combine this whole library and unique thing. And it'll it like geotags pictures so it knows if people are in there. Or it'll automatically go through your photo album and find the best pictures and categorize those for you to send to people. And it has like built-in sharing features. It's like, hey, this was a really good picture. There's a lot of people in it. And would you like to share it? You know, which I mean, is a little much for me, you know, trying to force sharing on me. But I think it's a cool idea, you know this auto shareable thing, you know, like I took a picture of Alex, me and him together and it automatically like, Hey, do you want to share this with him? You know, he probably thinks this is really cool, but I took like 30 pictures and it only picked like the best two out of all of that to share with him. Yeah. I really liked that. And one of the things that I think it was like in their, like the, the little demo video of them explaining it, it's like, you are a terrible person. And they explained why just how something as simple as sharing is often like not done. I remember, for example, just like on a trip that I went on, like I took a lot of pictures with a lot of different people. And these different people asked me, hey, share this with me. Like it was on my camera. And I couldn't just like, just like, it wasn't a camera phone. It was like a camera, camera, you know? And, uh, and I would have had to take the SD card out, plug it into my computer, and um, upload them to Drive or yeah, Dropbox. Upload them to and do that but just like with this just like making it and just like with with cameras now able to access the internet I and mean, this would make sharing so much easier like i can literally just like take like five minutes i'm at it and share like hundreds of photos to so many different people and it's and it's simple and that, I, that's what i thought was very impressive was just the simplicity of sharing just like well, how they've made it now. Exactly. I think we're going to see that in the future. I'm calling it now. We're going to see a lot of shared experiences and not so much like sharing to social media, but sharing to groups of people. A perfect example of where this would have been handy is I took some pictures uh, that Austin liked on my phone. Like I had some cool pictures and Austin really liked them. He's like, hey, send those to me. And he kept having to bother me about it. Hey, share those with me. Hey, share those with me. Hey, share those with me. And I kept just neglecting and forgetting to do it. You know what I mean? Because to do it is I'd have to go and I have to find each one and then I have to add it to Slack and I have to share it with Slack and then he has to download it and then we have two separate versions of it. And yeah, but what would be easy is if we just started a Google Photos shared library and I just dropped them in that shared library and then he could continue to drop stuff and we could build this awesome library. You're going to see a lot of that kind of technology where shared with a group of people rather than this mass social media. You're going to see that coming very soon. Actually. One of the cool things they announced was Google Lens, uh, which kind of blew my mind. So now you can be able to take the pic. You can take, they've been kind of building up to it for a while, but they're finally ready to release it where you can take a picture of, say, their example they used was a flower. Uh, they took a picture of a flower and it told you what kind of flower it was. Or you took a picture of a building and it told you what building it was. Or you took a picture of a painting and it told you what painting it was. Which is really insane technology. To the point that it's better than humans. Like, their, vi their, uh, their, uh, de uh, uh, their detection. I can't remember what the words they use. Their, uh, uh, something detection. Just kind of shape detection almost. Shape detection or, uh, object so detection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. O object detection was better than humans, actually, which is pretty insane to say that. Like, it could, like, I could take a picture of a water bottle and it knows it's a water bottle before I know it's a water bottle or better than me, which is pretty insane. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really cool was in that demonstration, they had, like, they took a picture of a storefront and it gave them the ratings. Just like, this has four out of five stars. And then you could take a picture of another store or another restaurant. Oh, but this one has four and a half out of five stars. You know, just like it was like something like that. Just like I could like literally like pull my phone out, snap a picture, and I already know what it's like. Which is pretty incredible. You don't have to go in there. You don't have to do anything. And this is really cool technology, or just the power to be able to like take a picture of 
an edible wild edible and it can tell you if it's going to kill you or not you know i mean you're, not, yeah. you're probably going to be out in the wild and have your phone and everything but it's the idea behind it that's really impressive i mean that's pretty cool and then they kind yeah. of got into youtube stuff which we won't discuss because that was just a debacle was it not oh it was that was horrible it was, it was almost painful to watch it was ah, man everybody every department of google was coming out with the coolest features i mean jam-packed full of new technology and then youtube comes out and nothing just fluff just total fluff uh, my my problem was not not that it was advertising because that's all it was i just say oh youtube's still great youtube's wonderful and all this stuff but like they, they couldn't even get their stuff like they had the teleprompter right in front of them off screen that they were obviously looking at and they, they still got got their stuff all all mixed up yeah, the poor CEO, I can't remember her name, Susan something, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. It's just, which not many people are a fan of her, me included, sadly. Uh, and it was just fluff. It was just like, hey, we're we're advertiser friendly. Look at all these cool things that people are doing with YouTube when it wasn't really cool things. It was like, they had nothing to do with YouTube. The fact that people were just used it. And it's just... It was just cool. The only cool thing about it was they used the slow-mo guys, which even could have been cooler than that. It was pretty dope. Their big announcement, their big announcement for for YouTube was Super Chat. Yeah. Which is a feature that's been built into Twitch and, uh, at, at, since Amazon's got it, or even third parties been building it into things for years. I mean, years, like almost like three or five years, you know, it's been there for so long having this ability to send a message and, or donate money to do it. And it was just like, wow, what, what trash? And it's YouTube gaming. That's not even the core of YouTube. That's just like their competitor to Twitch because someone had to do it. You know, I mean, what a, what a bummer, man. Yeah. I, I was super excited. Cause just like, because the thing was like YouTube, like they weren't just thrown in there. YouTube went right after the announcement of Google Photo and Google Lens. And me and Eric were just pumped. Just like, oh, that was so cool. That was so dope. And then YouTube came in and just had nothing new to offer. And it, it, it kind of hurt. Yeah, it was. I, I felt cheated. It was like, wow. Like, because YouTube, is, in my opinion, is one of the core Google products. If not, I mean, it's up there with Google, you know, there's Google and then there's YouTube, you know, I don't think of Google photos. I don't think of Google lens. I don't think of anything. I think of Google and YouTube and as content creators and someone, not just as a content creator on YouTube, as a, uh, a YouTube red subscriber and a viewer. And I ingest so many hours of YouTube content. It's not even funny. It was, it was just, it was just disappointing. And it just kind of keeps, it keeps solidifying my views on how rough of a year it's been and is going to continue to be for youtube if they don't get their act together you know so but we won't we won't stick on that note very long we'll get to the good stuff and then after that something even awesome even cooler happened uh they started talking about google ar and google vr Do you remember that what were some of the announcements mm -hmm. they had with that some of the um i don't really remember i had to get up and edit last week's podcast about the time ar and vr so, came so, on yeah so i'll talk about it for a second the uh so VR, they talked a lot about uh, Google Dreamscape, I think is what it's called, and, and Google Cardboard and all of that stuff, which is which is really great. They're still into the VR spectrum, and they still think it's a it's a viable method, which is cool, and they're going to milk it for all it's worth. But then they got into AR and kind of the cool things they're talking about AR, and they really pushed AR with education, and which is really cool to see these kids holding their phones. And one of the videos they played was like these kids watching a volcano explode through AR on their phone, which is really cool experience, actually. Um, and it's an interesting paradigm to look at because with all these cool new technologies like Google Cardboard and their new AR stuff that they're building and the AR to be able to walk through stores and see these point scapes. And uh, uh, I mean, there's a little bit of augmented reality having to be used for Google lens and all of these different stuff. Uh, it brings up an interesting question about uh, the good enough experience that we talk a lot about, you know, I talk about it with VR mostly because that's like a, a firsthand case of it happening. Is this uh, a, a, uh, um, you know, VR came out, Oculus and Vive and came out, but not many people bought it because, you know, they had their little smartphone devices and they thought that was a good enough experience. You know, why pay 800 bucks when I can get a tenth of the experience for a tenth of the cost? You know what I mean? Which they're fine with, which is a good enough experience for consumers. And it brings up an interesting 
I didn't think it was going to happen so fast to AR. I thought AR was going to have its time to shine with like wearables and uh, Google Glasses and HoloLens and Meta and Magic Leap and all these different things. But I'm really starting to change my mind on it. And I think it might be a lot longer until we see a wearable revolution. What do you think? I'm kind of the same way because kind of taking it back to, to, to VR and the good enough experience, I remember recently trying, and this is just how far behind I am, recently trying the HTC Vive and how incredible of an experience that was, but having it be like more than $900, you know, just like it was a great experience, but it wasn't $900 great, you know. But if something else comes along that's say like one or two, hundred bucks or even like stuff for your phone now that's like barely 50 which is a good enough experience i'd be more apt to do that so i feel like um big companies like google and, and others like that have kind of seen that people are like you said eric they're willing to sacrifice for the good enough experience and they're they're a lot quicker to catch on this time with ar now that that's starting to get big they're a lot quicker to release their good enough devices which like you said yeah it's kind of a bummer I feel bad just because stuff like the HoloLens has just been something so revolutionary. And granted, like like Cardboard and other programs, like, yeah, they're cool, but they're not HoloLens cool, you know? And I guess that, that's the sacrifice you have to make with good enough technology. It's it's cheaper to get, and it's more accessible. And people are more apt to buy something like that. Exactly. And, I, and, and uh you're right. And it's the same thing with Vive. Like, I mean, the Vive experience is incomparable to a Google Cardboard experience. You know what I mean? The Vive experience is just something else, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. So it's sad to see that something like that just kind of comes and goes. So we're seeing this kind of same thing. And I didn't think it was going to happen so fast. You know, uh, Google Tango had their little try at it. And I, that's what they're still pushing is this Google Tango experience. And uh, they show they showed a cool diagram that shows that devices are actually getting smaller, you know, uh, over time. You know, they built out this big Google Tango tablet and devices are now getting smaller. First, it was on a tablet and now then it was on like a mini tablet. And now it's on people's phones and to do this AR stuff. And they it's really just uh it's going to be interesting in the next little year to see what survives or what gets pushed or what doesn't get pushed you know because you know if someone has ar on their phone why are they going to want uh, a hololens or that kind of experience so it, it'll be interesting to see i mean i've always thought the death of the smartphone was really close upon us but i'm starting to rethink some of my uh opinions on that matter but uh yeah, what do you think about that? Um, I just, I, I just want to kind of call you out real fast. You talk about the death of smartphone. Like, what, what do you think could replace the smartphone? Something like a Hololens esque experience, you know. And I say Hololens esque because I mean that that could mean a lot of different things. Uh, whether it's a, it doesn't have to be a Hololens or whether it's even that kind of device, but some sort of wearable technology that. Uh, because, I mean, with a phone, it's just another device, you know. Then you still, with your phone, you still have to have a computer. You still have to have a, uh, a TV. You still have to have, not, not as much as you used to, but you still have to have all of these other external devices, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but with something like a HoloLens, like a Super HoloLens, uh, you don't need any of those devices. You can have one device that does everything. And that's what I'm kind of seeing, a, a pseudo, a super device, a pseudo super device, you know. Uh, and whatever that might be, whether it's a watch that can display holograms or something, but I just see that the the people get, and and as far as um, sales go and stuff, I mean, people are getting there's not as much technology to keep adding with smartphones, whereas this is a whole new market to start selling to people and stuff like that. So that's kind of the avenue I see. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Like if something like like Google Glass, for example, had the capabilities of the Hololens or like the Super Hololens, that could definitely work. I remember like that little that short video that we saw a little while ago about just like how the holo I don't even know how to explain it. Just like there were holograms everywhere. The hyper reality and, video. Yeah, the hyper reality video. Yeah, I remember watching that. Just like there were no smartphones in that, just because everything you needed was right there like phone calls popped up right in front of your eyes exactly and just like transactions right in front of your eyes everything literally right in front of your eyes i remember like apple was just like everything at the tip of your fingers 
No, no, no. The future is going to be right in front of your eyes. Exactly. Everything is or around you. Everything is in your space, you know, yeah. whether it's in front of your eyes or if it's, uh, you know, on the wall behind you or if it's floating above you, it's going to be in your space, but you're not going to need an external device for that. Uh, and I think that's kind of the future I see it. Uh, so, so it'll be interesting to see how, how this evolves. And I, a, the reason we talk about it again, because we, we've, we've talked about this a lot, but it's been a lot more theoretical because we haven't seen a hardcore AR device. But right now is kind of the time with the occipital thing and uh, the, uh, the occipital thing for the iPhone and uh, Google doing this kind of Google stuff at uh, schools and marketing and the augmented reality thing going through i mean the augmented reality experience going through lows and stuff like that we're, we're, we're starting to kind of see these these evolutions so it'll be interesting to see what happens or what rises up or what doesn't rise up or how it catches on it's just an exciting time one thing i we forgot to mention is on google lens do you remember that they took a picture of a girl behind a fence and that artificial intelligence came through and edited out the fence seamlessly yeah I do remember that. That was mind blowing, dude. That blew my mind. That was insane. Yeah, I remember. And the first thing that came to our minds, let's get, and we touched on this in the last podcast. Imagine that in a film editing software program. Just like, where's Adobe at? That's the first thing we asked because, like, editing a fence out that simple on your phone. Like, I, I would have never thought of that before having before seen it in, take for example, Premiere Pro. Or even video editor. Or Photoshop. Or editor. You know, why, why, I don't or know. Photoshop. I'm not a Photoshop master, so it might have a built-in feature like that. But I don't think it does. You could probably do it pretty quick and easily without artificial intelligence. But uh, the fact that you can just click one button and automatically clean up your entire screen is pretty impressive. Yeah, like anybody can do it now. Because just like, yeah, like even if there is something like that on Photoshop, you have to figure out how to do it first. It, and like... Unless you take a class or like look for it on YouTube specifically, it's going to take you a while to figure it out. So for just everyday people to just take a picture, press a button, and have it gone, that, that, that says something on Google's part right there. That's very, very impressive. You know, another pseudo form of artificial intelligence people aren't going to even know that they're going to realize, <laughs> you know, that they're, that they're using, which is, which is insane that we're seeing this. Uh, I mean, it's hard to call it the auto – the 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 artificial intelligence revolution i'd say it's more the automation revolution but uh it's hard to call it the artificial intelligence revolution when this has been happening i mean photoshop did that i mean photoshop stole a lot of people's jobs that were really good at, at, at developing photos and stuff but i mean it's just the future and that's what we're here for is to document it and it's cool to have these podcasts that we can in the future look back and be like wow we we thought this was going to happen or wow we totally called that or how naive we were and stuff yeah yeah, one thing talking about like AI once again is that people like are afraid of change, but they also look for something to blame that's different. You know what I'm saying? Because companies and businesses they're always looking for different ways to streamline, to cut down costs, to cut overhead, and in that process, jobs are going to get slashed. People are going to lose their jobs, but people just kind of accept that. And not like, I'm not saying like, oh, darn it, I got laid off. That can be a very devastating thing for a family. Mm -hmm. But we see that as, as something, you know, just like layoffs. Layoffs happen. But when AI comes in, AI simply does what, business, what businesses have been trying to do. AI is going to do the same thing. It's going to allow for businesses to cut costs, to slash overhead, and to, you know, people are going to have to get laid off. But there's a face to the criminal, and that is AI. That face is AI. And people are going to be like, oh, it's taking jobs. When jobs have been taken and have been taken for years and years and years before. Just a different just medium. Hasn't been apparent. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, jobs will be taken just from a different medium. But what will be interesting to see is like, we all know it's coming, but what will interest me is to be the solutions that come up around this because it's going to cause problems. And I'm excited to see the solutions that people are coming with. And we've talked about this in the podcast a lot, which sadly, it's not the government coming up with the solutions. It's random, you know, CEOs of companies or random everyday people. So it's a really exciting time. There's lots of problems to solve. and There's going to be continue more problems to solve, which is good which is good. We, we need problems to solve as humans. 
But yeah, and we talked about that a lot, like extensively in one of our earlier podcasts. So maybe, if, uh, I think it's called, I don't remember which one it is, but if you guys look back through all the podcasts, if you guys are interested in that kind of discussion, we, we, we talked about it in length and our opinions on basic income and the way that automation and will we'll, we'll solve those problems. So go ahead and check those out. So uh, we thought tonight was going to be a short podcast, but it ended up being an actually a, one of our longer <laughs> ones. You know, we're going um, about hour and 10 minutes, I think right now, maybe even a little bit longer. Yeah, about hour and 20 right now, but, but that's okay. <laughs> that is that is okay. So uh, I'd like to, any, any closing words? Nope. Just a big thanks to everybody joining in the live stream and a thanks to everybody who is listening in on us in the pre-recording uh you know big thanks to all your support and comment down below um it, whether or not you agree or disagree but don't forget to timestamp because it makes us a lot harder to respond if we don't know what you guys are talking about so by all means let us know what you feel how you feel just timestamp that's that's kind of a big thing for us so yes exactly right so he basically covered all my stuff so that's awesome i can just basically close it out so uh uh we were on the AR Dirt podcast recently, so with Joseph Rampola, so go ahead and check that out. We'll probably throw a little bit of a tidbit at the beginning about that. Uh, we were interviewed. It was really great, so check that out if you guys haven't yet, and we're actually looking for people to interview on our podcast. We want to kind of... It was really a fun experience, and we thought that would actually fit in quite well with our experience, so if you think you have something to add or to input or uh, just want to talk with us or have a discussion you know, about something interesting... Uh, whether it's emerging technology or the Hall Herald or it's something you're working on, go ahead and uh, let us know. And we will uh, either hit us up on Twitter or in the comments down below or message us on YouTube and we'll be in touch. Uh, thank you very much. This has been the Hollow Herald podcast, episode 13, signing off. Thanks, guys.